Now, I know that the instinct is to instantly thumbs down given the title of the video, but I want everyone to hear me out first. There's no doubt that there are plenty of videos on the internet critiquing the Neon project. And so far, it's pretty much become sort of an easy target for everyone to point and laugh at. So much so that any topic about Neon has become an echo chamber at this point. Even if you believe that this criticism is rightly deserved, what we shouldn't do is confine ourselves to an echo chamber where it limits our views of the world. This is why I'm going to go against the grain here and actually try to make the case for why Neon isn't as bad of an idea as many critics have you believe. For those who don't know what the Neon project even is, it's an infrastructure project that was announced by Saudi Arabia that is projected to cost over $500 billion. Essentially, it's a new city project that they're building in the northwestern Tabuk province of the country. The Saudi Arabian government is hoping that this project will transform the area into the city of the future. They want this place to be one of the most important global trading hubs and one of the most sought-out tourist destinations in the world. Within the online space, the Neon project has become synonymous with the linear city or the line as they call it, which is an entire city that is built in a straight line as you can see in their promotional video. This is where I see vast majority of criticisms against the Neon Project. But the Neon Project is more than just a line. It's actually a multi-mega infrastructure project that includes projects such as Sindala, a massive luxury resort complex off the city coast, Chujina, which will be the first major outdoor skiing destination in Saudi Arabia, Oxagon, a floating industrial complex that will be the focal point of manufacturing and research and development of Duba Port, and finally the Neon Bay and the Neon Airport, which is pretty much just a residential area with an airport. The project will likely continue to expand with more new infrastructure projects as time goes on. The cities will supposedly be powered entirely by renewable energy as well, thus adding to the claim that this will be the city of the future. Now, it's really, really important to emphasize that Saudi Arabian government needs to begin diversifying their economy away from oil, which makes up majority of their economy. 80% of Saudi Arabia's export income is in oil and it makes up 40% of its GDP. Since 2010, an average of 75% of total budget revenue of Saudi Arabian government also came from oil according to the IMF. By every metric, the Saudi Arabian economy is way too heavily relying on oil. Although I doubt that the world will completely phase out oil within our lifetime as it's an important part of industrial production, the reality is that more and more countries are beginning to diversify their source of energy and are also investing into the use of renewable energy and electric cars, which will inevitably affect the demand for oil. You could also argue that this process has also began to speed up due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict that is currently happening. And this is just the beginning of problems that the Saudi Arabian government will have to tackle in the coming future. A study conducted by McKinsey and Company back in 2015 shows that as time goes on, the Saudi Arabian government will no longer be able to sustain an oil-based economy, especially in the face of changes in global energy market as well as demographic transition of the country. You see, Saudi Arabia has a massive population of young people. Recent data shows that 63% of the population are under the age of 30, which means that Saudi Arabia will have to quickly expand their economy and create more jobs in order for the country to be able to sustain all these new influx of young people looking for jobs. The McKinsey study actually specifically predicted this predicament back in 2015 as it highlighted that Saudi Arabia would need to create almost three times as many jobs as they did during their oil boom. And obviously jobs don't just come out of thin air, the government needs to push specific policies and attract more foreign investors into the country in order to create new jobs. Especially in a country like Saudi Arabia where the country relies heavily on state-owned oil enterprises, this won't be enough to accommodate for the amount of people looking to enter the job market. Ultimately, if Saudi Arabia were to stick to a reactive policy change, the study makes the conclusion that the prospect of the country would look difficult as there wouldn't be enough jobs and that almost 20% of Saudi nationals could be unemployed. With demographic shifts and declining demand for oil, the study highlights that by failing to properly diversify their economy away from oil and by failing to adapt to the massive demographic changes coming into the place, the country would likely experience a decrease in household income, an increase in unemployment, and that the country would simply begin running out of money. But, it's also within the same report that gives an alternative scenario. A scenario where Saudi Arabia does pull through and actually does manage to radically transform their economy through a more proactive policy. In this scenario, the Saudi Arabian government and its people could experience a second wave of prosperity and would radically change the future trajectory of the country. Given this information, what should Saudi Arabia do? Should they just lie around and continue rotting? Or should they try to steer the fate of the country into another direction by introducing new policies that would dramatically change their country, even if one of these ideas might be pushing beyond the boundaries of what's even possible? And this is where the Neon Project comes in. Given all these problems, it's no wonder that Saudi Arabia is trying to build this city. You can tell by the location of the Neon Project that they're really looking for this place to be an important part of Saudi Arabian economy, as it's located near one of the most important trading routes in the world, the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is considered to be one of the most important trading routes in the world, accounting up to 12% of global trade. And it's not just the Suez Canal. The location is also near other trading hubs like the Aqaba Port and the Ila Port, and more, which are quickly becoming very important parts of the global trading network. 
Egypt themselves are also planning to expand this region further with a new Suez Canal project which will soon be able to almost double the daily transiting vessel. This project would mean that the Suez Canal revenue would increase from $5.3 billion at the present to $13.2 billion, an increase equal to 259%. There are also city and infrastructure development projects going on in these regions with the development of Suez City, Ismilia, and Port Said, which would further develop the region and create new economic opportunities. This location is without a doubt one of the most geographically advantageous regions in the Middle East when it comes to trading and shipping. The truth is that it would actually be really really stupid for Saudi Arabia to not pour billions into this area given just how valuable this place really is. Projects like the Neom Oxagon just make sense given the amount of trade that happens in this area and the amount of commerce activities that will happen in the future. Considering how much activity there will be in this area, their desire to transform this place into one of the most important trading hub and future tourist destination for the country isn't that crazy of an idea that many would have you believe. In fact, I'm pretty confident that had Saudi Arabia just presented the development of high capacity and efficient trading hub as a standalone project, people wouldn't be criticizing it as much because it just makes sense for them to do so from an economic standpoint. It just feels to me like some people are taking few parts of the project that they feel aren't viable and then using it as a focal point of criticism against this whole project. When in reality, if you look at it holistically, there are parts that actually make a lot of sense given the dynamic changes this whole region is experiencing. I've also seen some people argue that Saudi Arabia could be spending their money more efficiently and wisely. That instead of investing into these so-called useless projects aka vanity projects, that they could be spending on things like education, healthcare, and proven infrastructure projects that would guarantee benefits for the country's citizens. But what many of these people are missing is that they are already doing that. The totality of NEON project is just a small part of Saudi Arabia's effort to transform their economy away from oil. The Saudi 2030 vision was a plan introduced by the Saudi Arabian government under the leadership of Mohammed bin Salman back in 2016, which would transform Saudi Arabia away from oil to a more diversified economy. The NEON project is simply just one small part of the various different projects that Saudi Arabia is working on. Even as back as 2015, Saudi Arabia began prioritizing investing into its people, with public spending quadrupling during the decade, with most of it going into things like improving in education, social welfare, infrastructure, and transportation. And we actually do see this result today. Take female work participation as an example. The female work participation in Saudi Arabia jumped 64% within two years between 2018 and 2020. And these, by the way, include jobs that are traditionally considered for men that are in labor-intensive sectors such as construction, manufacturing, and accommodation and food. In terms of education, Saudi Arabia spends 8.8% of its GDP on it, which is double that of the world average. Saudi Arabia accounts for 60% of the Gulf Cooperation Council country's healthcare expenditure with healthcare and social development, making up 14.4% of its 2022 budget. All of these numbers have also gradually grown over the years. This idea that Saudi Arabia is tossing money into useless projects instead of investing into proven solutions to help its citizens just simply isn't true. Now, could things be better? Of course they can. Things could always be better. But there's nothing wrong with the country also investing into something that might be a bit more ambitious as long as they're making sure that they aren't neglecting other parts of development, which there isn't an evidence of. When you look at Saudi Arabia's non-oil GDP, you can see that it's actually been gradually growing. According to PwC, Saudi Arabia saw the share of non-oil economy at 59%, with non-oil GDP in 2022 being 15% larger in real terms, and 29% in nominal terms compared to the baseline before the Saudi 2030 vision. Not only is this a good sign for the future of the Saudi Arabian economy, but also further evidence that Saudi Arabia isn't just throwing money into useless projects that inevitably bring no results. Projects like the Neom is supposed to be something that pushes the boundaries of what is even possible even at the risk of it failing. It's not supposed to be a low risk investment. There are plenty of other projects that the Saudi Arabian government is working on for that. But that is not what Neom is about. Another critique I saw of the NEON project is that many of the ideas simply aren't technologically viable. But this is entirely missing the point of the project which again is to push the boundaries of what's possible even if that means developing new technology to make it work. If you actually watch the NEON documentary video, it's clear that even they think that the project is super ambitious. The documentary materials include scenes where the project managers, architects, and the lead engineers of the project are questioning the viability of the project. But again, that's the point. It's not a coincidence that they happen to include this in their promotion. It's supposed to be the super ambitious project that nobody has done before. So when the argument you're making is that this project sucks because a lot of things aren't technologically viable, you aren't actually making any decent argument against it. Because they themselves know that a lot of things they're suggesting are ambitious. But that's the point. They're setting the bar really high for themselves to overcome. They say they want to create the city of the future. That's clearly not an exaggeration here. If you want to build an actual futuristic city, is it really that far-fetched to push the boundaries of what's technologically possible? 
There are also other really nitpicky criticisms that I've seen against Neon Project that seems to assume a lot of things about the project that just isn't founded in any facts. For example, I saw a critic online claim that the linear city or the line project wouldn't work because the reflective glass facade on the outside of the building would act as a magnifying glass that would reflect the Middle Eastern sunlight and burn everything around it. It sounds really problematic. Also, this giant mirror wall is going to reflect the light and it's going to create these two really, really hot heat zones and it's going to fry everything around it. And there's just a lot of things wrong with this assumption. Let's first address this idea that mirrors will reflect the Middle Eastern sunlight and create heat zones. Mirrors themselves don't magnify light unless it's in a concave where the light is concentrated in a much smaller area. So this idea that the light will reflect off the giant mirror wall and amplify the heat surrounding the area thus creating a heat zone just isn't true. Mirrors don't create more heat, it just reflects the existing light source. The only thing that's creating a heat zone in that area is the already intense heat from the sun that is blasting down into those areas anyway. A flat mirror building like the neon line isn't going to be the one creating any heat zone. I've also seen people raise concerns over potential issues of blinding glares created by the sun reflecting off the mirrored walls of the structure. For the record, similar problems like these have come up in other projects around this region such as the Burj Khalifa that also utilizes a glass facade where they had to innovate special anti-glare reflect glass technology to adjust intense sunlight reflecting off the buildings. Of course, this isn't to say that glares wouldn't exist at all, but it wouldn't be as much of a problem as some people People are exaggerating it out to be. There is also another particular critic here on YouTube criticizing the Neon project and he makes some really questionable assumptions that could just be debunked by a small bit of research. For example, the YouTube video criticizes the Neon project for relying on one single transit line to move people through the linear city. So you would be using the subway for local transportation and the maglev for long distance. And this is a problem. Since we're going in a straight 170 km long line, if there's any failure at any point, your system is immediately cut in half, not to mention necessary maintenance or overhauls. That would be complete chaos. This is what happens when you have a single transit line serving millions of people. Oh, you wanna ride the subway? Sorry, someone fell on the tracks 150 km down so now 5 million people are late from work. And if you need to get to the other end but the maglev breaks down, I hope you like traveling 200 stops on the subway for 5 hours because that's what you're going to do. For the record, there is no evidence that Neon will just have one single transit line. I have no idea where he is getting this from. They have a concept art showing off how their transit will look, but it is a concept art and they're clearly highlighting one line as a focal point for the presentation. And for the record, there are confirmations that the Neon project will have multiple mass transit options with multiple subways and multiple high-speed rail lines. And there will be other public non-car transportation available as well. So no, you will not have to rely on one transit line with a very obvious weak point. There are other really weird assumptions that this author makes, like this one segment about air taxis where supposedly there will be an indoor helicopter inside the line structure. And of course, the author goes on to say that this is a bad idea because flying an air taxi like that in a narrow area is dangerous and loud. And also air taxis, which has to be the stupidest, most dangerous idea of all. Running a helicopter in a narrow, semi-enclosed space like that within close proximity of public areas and housing. So not only will you go deaf from the noise and blind from the rotor wash creating a tornado of trash and dust, you'd also get blown down into the chasm, if the thing doesn't crash into the walls first due to some erratic turbulence. But I honestly have no idea where this author is even getting this idea from because I can't find a single evidence that they're going to fly this inside the line structure like he is saying. In fact, all the evidence points to the contrary as not only will the air taxis allow you to fly to a different section of the line, it will also act as a transportation option to other neon regions such as the Oxagon and Trigina. And of course, the Oxagon and Trigina are outside the line. So this at least confirms that there are air taxis operating outside the line structure. Given the fact that the top part of the line structure is also open for people to go up and down and there are perfectly viable landing zones at the top, it just logically makes more sense for the air taxi or helicopter to fly above the structure where there is a safe landing zone but also an ideal takeoff space where the air taxi can transport people to other neon locations like the Oxagon and Trigina. And it definitely makes way more logical sense than the assumption that somehow the people working on this is too stupid to realize that flying multiple helicopters indoors is a bad idea and that they actually will fly multiple helicopters inside the structure despite the fact that nobody in Neom is claiming this. This air taxi plan is also a joint venture with a German company that does seem to take safety regulations pretty seriously and they will be the ones responsible for making sure that this all runs smoothly. They're also working with pretty reputable third-party aviation consulting companies to make sure that all this is even viable and meets safety standards. Not only are these two arguments presented by the video just factually incorrect, but I also do feel that you have to assume the worst of the worst about this project to come to this kind of conclusion. You're free to not like this project, but these sort of criticisms just feel like a stretch to me. 
There are other nitpicky criticisms that he makes in the video that isn't as egregious but could have been presented better, like his segment about vitamin D and sunlight where supposedly the residents of the line wouldn't be able to receive enough sunlight unless they go all the way to the top or unless they live in a sunny side. D vitamin deficiency is also going to be an issue. In order to get sunlight, you either have to live on the sunny side or go all the way up to the top. Otherwise, life inside Neom would be rather depressing. This is something that's actually been addressed by the directors of Neom, and some more additional research gives us a clue as to what their solution could be. Some of the top parts of Neom is completely open to allow sunlight to penetrate all the way down to the ground level. The sides of the Neom structure is also made from a mirror facade, meaning that all the sides are supposed to allow sunlight to enter through the mirrored wall. The mirror is supposed to regulate temperature and light levels on the inside, and especially in a region abundant with sunlight, there shouldn't be an issue with the amount of sunlight getting in. Now, of course, we're currently just talking about the outside glass facade of the building. Depending on the materials, the building on the inside of the line could still block sunlight even if the line itself is made to allow light in. But the website does actually address this, where apparently the line will be designed to allow sunlight to penetrate inside the structure optimally. Now, to be fair, this is a little vague and does nothing to actually answer the question. Some of the concept models seems to show the usage of mirrors to bring light into areas that it wouldn't be reachable in. This is, of course, one of the methods that they could theoretically use to bring light into the area. They also have models showing how they could theoretically organize the inside in such a way that would be optimal for things like airflow and light, so it's definitely something that they've already considered. There is also the question of vertical transportation in the line structure. What kind of transportation could we expect when going from the ground level to the top level? But of course, the author of the video takes the most sensationalist view where he concludes that the Neon would pretty much have to have an insane amount of elevators and escalators to transport people, including those who are in low mobility groups. Aside from that, since we're building a city in 3D, everything also has to be accessible by low mobility groups. So we're looking at systems of elevators and escalators that take you up to 500 meters, multiplied along the entire length of 170 kilometers. To give you an idea, what this entails, the Empire State Building, which is as tall as Neom, has to operate 73 elevators to move people around. But let's be charitable and say Neom will only need 20 elevators for a given section. Let's also throw in 10 escalators for good measure. Suppose we have one of these elevator escalator systems every 500 meters. That's 6,800 elevators and 3,400 escalators. Yeah. According to the director of Neom, the line will provide a second topography that will allow you to walk or bike between levels and move vertically in the city. There will also supposedly be shuttles that could transport you between the levels if you need to. By the sound of it, it looks like they're going to rely more on ramps and gradual level changes than elevators and escalators. Of course, that's not to say that elevators and escalators wouldn't exist, but it does seem like they want to rely on walking as much as possible. Even if you are skeptical of any of these claims, I would have wished that the video would have included it, at least to show that this is something that they're well aware of rather than something so obviously stupid that they somehow missed. It's also an interesting architectural challenge that they need to overcome and it would have made for a more interesting critique video rather than a video that's pretty much beating the dead horse at this point. I also saw another video on YouTube where the author criticizes Saudi Arabia for having the goal of attracting 100 million tourists by 2030, which is one of their stated goal in the overall Saudi 2030 vision, and a big reason for why they're spending so much on things like the Neon Project. It is building these mega city projects with the intention of attracting 100 million annual visitors by 2030. To put that goal into perspective, the United States currently has around 80 million visitors yearly. So this is not gonna happen. The author implies that it's questionable for Saudi Arabia to aim for 100 million tourists because even America doesn't have that many tourists. And because this is an unreachable goal, that Saudi Arabia's investment into Neom and its ambitions are useless. For the record, this 100 million tourist number that Saudi Arabia is talking about also includes domestic tourism as well. And they did hit 67 million tourists as of 2021, and they are projected to actually hit pretty close to that 100 million much earlier than expected. The author of the video is clearly mixing up international tourism numbers with overall tourism numbers as he is likely looking at Saudi Arabia's international tourism numbers and then comparing it to America's international tourism numbers. There are also other really questionable conclusions that this YouTuber particularly makes. Like for example, his claim that Saudi Arabia allowing women to drive is largely a cosmetic surface level change. See, behind the shiny modern veneer of these super projects, the country is still largely unchanged. It still has a strict Sharia legal system. Now, sure, on the surface, it's going in the right direction. In recent years, the country's leader has touted new freedoms for Saudis, earning the country good press in the West. Just five years ago, women weren't allowed to drive in the kingdom, restaurants had to be gender segregated, and movie theaters and 
and concerts were completely forbidden. Now all of that has changed, but these changes are mainly cosmetic and do little to change the country's foundations and deeply rooted culture. For the record, allowing women to drive and work after it's been forbidden since the founding of the country is not a cosmetic or surface level change in any universe. Nor, by the way, is allowing women access to healthcare and education without needing consent of a male guardian, which the video didn't mention. Nor is allowing women to travel abroad and apply for passports freely, which also the video didn't mention. And these are just some of the changes. You can't just label an objective objectively massive change as a cosmetic surface level change just because you don't like the country. Nor can you label it that just because they haven't transformed their country overnight. It's true that Saudi Arabia still has a long way to go in many aspects, which the YouTube video actually did cover, but that should have been the main point that the video made. Not some weird critique about Saudi Arabia's deep rooted culture that I guarantee this critic has no understanding of other than throwing up buzzwords like Sharia legal system, which in itself is an incredibly complex topic. One thing I wish with all these critiques is that I wish they would just give Saudi Arabia some benefit of the doubt and look into it a little bit more. And if it turns out that it's still dumb, then you can call it out. But instead what seems to be happening is that people are just allowing their pre-existing opinions of Saudi Arabia affect their judgment. And this seems to be the consistent theme when I look at many critiques out there of the NEON project. And for the record, not all criticisms made by these videos are bad. It's just that these particular ones were really, really bad. I've already mentioned this, but pretty much a majority of criticisms against the NEON project is against the line or the linear city. It was actually rather difficult to find criticisms against the other projects. I did see some people claim that it's stupid for Saudi Arabia to build things like the Neom Trujina, a project where they plan to build Saudi Arabia's first outdoor skiing resort because the region is hot. But this specific region that the Trujina is being built in is a colder part of Saudi Arabia where temperatures do drop below zero in the winters. It's also in an elevated range which tends to be colder. This criticism was probably at its peak when Saudi Arabia won the bid to host the 2029 Asian Winter Games. But again, the amount of criticisms against this project alongside all the other neon projects that I didn't mention was very minimal compared to the criticisms that the line of the project received. There is also the question of CO2 emissions that will be produced by this project. For the record, it's inevitable in the sense that you're going to produce CO2 when building a brand new city. It's also inevitable in the sense that this area will develop anyways. So then the question isn't whether or how much CO2 it will produce during the production, but rather how much it can prevent and even save in the future. One of the more impressive projects of NEOM in my opinion is a NEOM Green Hydrogen Project, which will create the largest green hydrogen generation plant in the world. And this is a totally viable technology already, and something that's been in production and will be completed soon. Now there are actually really decent criticisms and questions that people have for the NEON project that I've seen. Like for example, how will the city continue to expand with the growing population? It seems like the city is designed to accommodate for 9 million people. What if more people want to live there? There are also ideas that might be a bit more fantastical, like a giant artificial moon, robot martial artists, robot dinosaurs and more. But I'm not going to sit here and interpret this in the least charitable way possible, like the way that other critics have done. I understand that these are supposed to be some crazy concepts that the leadership at Saudi Arabia just kind of threw out as an initial draft. In fact, the consultants clearly mixed in many sci-fi elements to the project on purpose. There's also the question of how this project will impact some of the ecosystems and natural habitat within that region as well, or that the linear cities have historically been rather questionable. They never seem to work out in the way that developers hope it does. These are some of the really good questions and concerns that others have raised. The problem is that many of the people who answer these questions don't seem to be answering them in good faith. And I want everyone to remember that the purpose of this video isn't to convince you why the NEON project is actually awesome or that it will actually 100% pan out in the way that they say it will with zero compromises whatsoever. Because the truth is I don't really know all the details of the project and aside from the limited information the project also seems to continually evolve as time goes on with new development. In the early stages of the project it was determined that the different levels of the NEON line would be dedicated to different amenities with different zonings. For example public transportation being strictly underground whereas pedestrian zones being in the upper floor but it does seem like this plan has actually changed and now they've embraced more of what they call a hyper mixed use urbanism where they want to build a place where you can find pretty much everything everywhere this also means having public transportations in between various different levels of the line instead of just the underground because of the nature of this project there just aren't enough information out there for me to make a definitive judgment on this project until it is finished but at the same time i can pretty much confidently say that many of the critics of the project are just as clueless as i am so what you shouldn't do is allow people who are clueless about this project to influence you into making assumptions that isn't even based in reality. It is entirely possible that the criticisms against Neon will turn out to be correct and that none of this will pan out the way that it's been revealed. Especially when talking about the line or the linear city, it could end up as a disaster like everyone is saying that it is. 
But given how important the region is and Saudi Arabia's material conditions, which necessitates them pushing for radical transformation of their economy, I don't doubt that this region will continue to develop regardless of whether this project will work out or not. But ultimately, it feels to me like many people's criticisms of NEOM isn't even coming from a neutral or objective analysis, but rather their pre-existing opinions of Saudi Arabia. Of course, many people, especially in the West, dislike Saudi Arabia because they don't meet the standards of Western liberal democracies. And those people also see this project as a PR attempt by the country. But this isn't a good justification for going around and making over-exaggerated and disingenuous claims about the viability of the project itself. Again, I want to really emphasize here that the goal of this video isn't to convince you that the NEON project is viable or awesome because frankly speaking, I don't really know until it's completely built. But the goal of the video is to definitely challenge you to really think about the way in which your bias affects your assessment of the project, as well as the way in which other uninformed critique affects the way you assess this project. It's good to take a step back and actually try to have a critical analysis of the project. And afterwards, if you still feel that the project is a bad idea, that's fine. But at least then you can proudly say that you came to that conclusion on your own analysis.